So I'm the William Stewart Halstead Professor of Surgery, Department Director of Surgery at Johns Hopkins Medical Institutions, and the Surgeon in Chief of the Johns Hopkins Hospital. I um, was born in Decatur, Illinois, and then we moved to Carbondale, Illinois when I was one, and actually we lived there till I was seven. And when I was in first grade in Carbondale, Illinois, I skipped first grade. And my older brother uh, was a year older than me, and I sort of read all his books and did what he did. So it was a small school, and I skipped that grade. Uh, that year when my grandfather came, who was my mom's dad, he said, you know, Julie, they're going to tell you you can't do things. And you're going to tell him, yes, you can. So when I started at University of Illinois, I thought I was going to be a biology high school teacher. That was my plan. And I was taking science classes and getting ready to go into education when they actually closed education. They thought there were going to be too many teachers. So I decided I liked science the best and went pre-med. Going to Rush University, it was a very interesting class. Norma Wagner had been the dean of students, and 42% of the class were women, which was a graduating class in 1980, which was unusual. In my fourth year, I actually traveled a bit. I did some rotations in San Francisco and Los Angeles and Arizona, because I really wanted to get outside of Illinois and see something different. I ended up matching at UCLA for my surgical residency. It was an interesting time when we came as interns. There actually were three women interns that year out of 26, and there had been a few. I ended up being the sixth woman to finish at UCLA in general surgery. There were no women faculty members, and there were a very few residents ahead of you that were women. Uh, they had just finished a woman chief resident the year before we came, and actually I had met her, and when I think back, that may have been quite influential to see someone actually finish the program versus just start. I had very few patients, maybe just a handful, that would ask you, are you really sure you're the surgeon? Are you really sure uh, you should be talking to me? And, and there was one story when I was a chief resident where a patient who was sort of a famous person asked the fellow what I did. You know, do you let that girl operate? Do you let that girl do things? And to this day, Bill has never told me exactly what he said to them. I think over time, I think we've got a few more years to go, that there's more women that it doesn't become as notable as when I got this job. I mean, everybody knows where they were standing when they heard I got this job. So part of it was trying to um, effect change, and then they, you knew everybody's eyes were on it because there weren't that many women chairs, still aren't. I think there's still under 10 ever to do it. Um, and that people would look at it as a positive thing. I'm the only the sixth chair ever here that's been a woman. There aren't that many more in the country. You know, it hasn't been a revolution. It's going to be an evolution, I think. Part of it is just a culture change all over, and I think it actually has happened across the country for women. And then I think patients like it, too. Too, They want to be um, treated with kindness. They want a lot of information. You know, they want to hear from you. They're used to hearing about your families. My patients ask me about my kids and what's going on with it. So I think all those things put together are real special. Hey, how are you? So I think we're going to get physical therapy working with you today and get you out of bed to do that. You, you want to have it all. You, if you want to have a family, you want it. If you want to have outside interests, you want it. You, you want to be a busy surgeon. You do have to temper your enthusiasm. You're running the department. I don't operate every day anymore. And I don't do big cases every day. I, I am a specialist in this rib resection, so they can come in and go home to do it. And I have adjusted my intensity of how much clinical work I do. Um, but I think you have to decide how you're going to make sure you take good care of what you're doing, which your patients need you to answer them, and you need to be there to talk to them. And like with him this morning, he needed to know I think he should get out of bed. That was my job today, was to get him out of bed and tell him he's safe. Because I did not see him yesterday because it was Mother's Day and I told him I wouldn't be in here unless he was sick, so he knew I wasn't coming yesterday. Don't be disappointed. It's going to get there. Yeah. And it, people say it takes a month to feel totally normal, two weeks to feel 80% of normal. So you're still in the first week. So you will not be like this. You will be back to fighting speed before you know it. When we've written these uh, articles about stress and strain, it's all this work-life balance, collision of time, trying to get everything done in a certain amount of time. And, and families have to give and work has to give too. Um, 
my son's in this lacrosse uh, fi semifinals tomorrow. I'm supposed to be in Milwaukee. I can't see it. And he knows I can't make everything, but he needs to win because I want to see the game Friday. So if he wins, I will. So the thing that excites me most about surgery now in my uh, wake of life is not only doing it myself, but teaching it to others. So when I do operations now, I'm teaching the next generation of surgeons, and I come to work every day to make sure they know how to do operations, and they can do it well, they can relate to patients and take care of it. And there's nothing better than watching them do the operation with you and know that they've achieved that. We're gonna do a left first rib resection. She's a soccer player actually quite a very good soccer player, thrombosed her arm, uh, sort of kept playing soccer till she came to us. If you come and lead change and no one follows, by definition, you're not really leading, you know, you're, you're just out there in front. Uh, and I was hoping that it would turn into the best place that people would want to train still. And we do have new generation people, you know, we've got different generation, different ethnicities, women, and that um, people would embrace the changes to make that happen. And I think even when I trained, I always was like this. My biggest fear was I would change into someone else, you know, so you don't want to be someone else trying to make it happen. So I think as with all women, when you look at how you're going to craft your career, most of our careers are um, not scripted. We tend to be more reactive than proactive. Sometimes I think we all still wonder if you're good enough to be there. You know, are you strong enough and good enough to be department chair? Did you do all the right things? Could you have done better with the budget? Could someone have else done better with the case? So I think there's still some times where I wonder whether or not I've done the right thing or whether or not uh, I've had all the right tools. I think we may see different paradigms for women and men as we go forward, and you don't necessarily have to be in such a rush to get to the, the final piece to do it. And, and just because you're not a chair at age 40 doesn't mean that you can't be a chair at age 50 or age 60. So experience everything, say yes to everything, watch everything, pay attention to everything, because you never know. The serendipity part of lives of who you meet, what you touch, where you land, and all the places and people you'll meet are just amazing. And you really don't know where you're supposed to end up. Even now, I don't know where I'll be spending the next 20 or 30 years of my life if I'm so blessed to have it. I did promise my son uh, when I had him at age 40, I'd live to 100. And so the plan is I'm living till I'm 100. And so I do have uh, 43 more years as far as I'm sh uh, sure to do that. And, and what will you do? And, and never pause to say, yes, I can. You've changed it, you've made it different, you've altered it, you've kept the good things that were there. Uh, people still want to come to Hopkins, uh, and if anything, they want to come to Hopkins even more, and, and you've really diversified the pool that are maybe interested to come see you, and that's been really exciting because I think we're better because of it.